Okay, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we explore the experiences of different individuals, their lived experiences from the um, Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Um, this week, it's a real pleasure to have a, our guest with us today, and she is Maxine Myers. And Maxine is the A... I'm going to let her explain. She's a communications manager here at Imperial College London, um, but she's she's so much more than that. Um, Maxine, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Um, and I want to just kick off our conversation by asking you to just tell us a little bit about what it was that gave you your sense of belonging as you were growing up um, in childhood. Well, thank you for having me, Wayne. I'm really glad to be part of this um, series. Um, I guess um, st starting a bit about me. So yeah, I um, managed the communications um, at Imperial for the medicine, uh, for medicine. So our partnership between Imperial, the college and with our NHS trust in Northwest London. So I've been doing that for quite some time now. And um, in terms of like the sense of belonging um, from childhood, I really, really attribute down to my parents really um you know I grew up I have West Indian parents so my both my parents are from Jamaica and they came over here when they were 18 um and so um growing up I was very much immersed in the culture really through food you know um through the music uh through the talk through you know relatives um friends we lived in um uh, an estate where it was predominantly people from the Caribbean and stuff and we're being in and out of each other's houses and stuff so you know I always felt that sense of belonging and who I am yeah just through, through those ways really yeah so your your parents coming from the Caribbean from Jamaica they had that strong Caribbean um and I suppose when they came over they were just coming into their adulthood as it were um so they were exploring the UK but at the same time they had their family which they were then bringing up but bringing up in the culture of the the West Indies so and you you mentioned there about the fact that you had aunts and uncles and the community which so it was not just the family it was also the community that you were in yeah. it kind of like engendered that sense of belonging so how did you view yourself did you view yourself as British did you view yourself as as Jamaican where where did you kind of um I guess both so um yeah I, I definitely felt like I, I viewed myself as Jamaican because that's the culture that I grew up in even though right. I'm born here yeah. and so um but in terms of like values and it was a combination of both I think um my mom I think with my parents like although they moved here at 18 and now they're both like in their 70s and stuff so they've spent mm. most of their lives over here but they're yeah. very much Jamaican and yeah. that's and I think there was that conflict and clash between the two different cultures so as I was growing up especially as a teenager I wanted to go to sleepovers I wanted to go to the parties and I want and there was like no 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 we don't get sleep at other people's houses and I'd be like everyone's gone for a sleepover this weekend I'm not allowed to go there and that was like oh no you're being British that's when you're being British or if I want to go to parties and stuff at 14 and stuff and have boyfriends no no they're very like, like those conservative like values were coming out through my parents and stuff and that was where the clash is so yeah I've I guess I felt um I felt it both really it's really yeah it's a difficult one I felt British and Jamaican at the same time and but uh, yeah 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 if that makes sense. <laughs> No, it makes, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. So I, I'm going to explore something and then come back to that in a, a second, just in terms of, so your home culture was was um, West Indian, Caribbean. And then when you got into school, what was your sense of identity or, or how did you get your sense of belonging when you got into school? How was school for you? Yeah, that was more challenging, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I've definitely felt, I never, just different at school. So um, I went to, I grew up in Wembley mm -hmm. and that's Brent was the council. And then when it was time to like pick your um, secondary schools at the time when I was, um, Brent 
the schools there, my local um, secondary school, it's just had a, a really poor reputation. It was not a very good school. And this, and obviously they send you to the, your nearest school. Yeah. So my mum was like, nope, don't want you to go there because you're just going to, education is so important to my parents and stuff yeah. and the power of it. So she realised that sending me to school in Harrow, the neighbouring borough where they had fantastic, fantastic schools up to standard schools. That's where she wanted me to go. And they found a route for me to do that. But the consequences of that is that it was predominantly white. So I was like the only black child in my class. I was one of three black um, girls in the year. Um, yeah. You know, so it was that was challenging because I've never felt more exposed and so different. So people, you know, my mum would make our packed lunches and it would be like the leftover chicken from the night before on the Sunday and stuff. She put in my sandwiches and, you know, she would. And then I would go and eat it. And then people were like, what's that smell? What are you eating? What yeah. are like? And I never, and then I felt self-conscious about eating in front of people because they'll just ask really stupid questions or make me feel really self-conscious mm -hmm. and stuff. And, you know, as a 11, 12 year old, you know, trying to get to like your head so, around that. Uh, yeah. too much. And then that made so yeah. So that made me feel even I shrunk myself and then I'm almost like, oh. I should be embarrassed about this. And I remember like my mum and I have talked about this now, but she would say, to, I would be like, no, mum, I don't want you to cook that kind of food because and bring and make me bring it into school. I just want to eat what all the other kids are eating because then I'll have a easier time with it. And then I don't have to answer questions about why does my food look like this? Why does it smell like this? Mm -hmm. it, it's weird. And it's like, just put some like cheese in the bread or some tomato, like some ham in the bread. Like, you know, I just want to yeah. fit it rather yeah. than like having to explain my culture, even though I was comfortable and happy and loved it at home once I was outside the home it was, it was almost made me feel embarrassed and like I was uncomfortable about it because of the reaction to it right that's an inter that's interesting because it was it's almost like because you were one you were a minority and, and as you said it was you you were the only black child in your class yeah. um and then there was only three black girls that you said in the whole of so it was a girl all girl school was it oh no it was a mixed school but mixed school yeah, yeah. But, okay were there any were there many black boys there that you yeah, can remember three and i know their three. name even now off by heart <laughs> ashley <laughs> jermaine <laughs> and andrew they were there yeah so six of us there was literally six of us and obviously we all saw each other we all tried to like band together be like yeah. alone in this very sea of white faces we need to stick together <laughs> see and that that's it's very interesting and the reason why i say that is i was um listening to a talk yesterday which was why do all the black children sit together in the cafeteria and um, by professor um beverly daniel tatum um and she tries to address that that concept of identity and where we get our identity from and it's just so so coincidental that you are now saying that was it did you guys sit together in the cafeteria or were you more mixed did, did you get comfortable in the surroundings which you were in yeah so we were sort of um we so I was our year was split into two year like two separate years two se yeah yeah so we kind of had different timetables and stuff right. and so we didn't hang out but we mm -hmm. were just you know like when you do the nod when you like see somebody else that's not white and you like do the nod and you're like yeah I see you know it was more like that but yeah. it was more like if we were in the playground to all like have a chat and stuff or yeah. you know lunch times and things like that yeah. yeah okay so at school you mentioned about pack lunches what about other things like um how else did did children or did the other students make you feel different in any other way and and how did you cope with that yeah um I think from a class perspective, so, you know, um, it was an incredibly middle class intake. So people had like parents would drop their kids off and like, you know, they'll be like, my mom's got a car, my dad's got a car, big houses, nice houses. I grew up on a council estate and then um, I grew up in council housing. So I felt like I was straddling two worlds. I'll leave Wembley, I'll leave where I lived and then I'll go into Pinner and it was a totally different world. And like, you know, people had 
several holidays a year or you know um they had allowances and that blew my mind when people would be like oh I already got my 20 pound allowance this week and I went what so your parents just give you money for doing nothing <laughs> you know, when I got my and I, when I got my national insurance number and I was 16 I went out and got a job because I was yeah. like if I want to buy my like clothes and go to top shop and all that stuff I'm gonna have to work and yeah. so I had a Saturday job and I also worked like Thursday evenings and stuff and that was my way of like paying for things and also taking a bit of the burden off my parents and stuff yeah. like travel I covered my own travel costs and stuff yeah. so yeah so there was there was that difference as well like not just race but class um just yeah complete yeah separation in that from that perspective so 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 effectively you're saying from from when you got into secondary school it wasn't just about the racial difference which, which was was happening but there was also the class difference in terms of the the wealth and how the wealth allowed privilege it allowed them to ha experience something different compared to your experience um so how did that make you feel uh, and, and within your friendship groups was there any kind of like conflicts or anything like that or how did you come to terms with that um I, I probably didn't do this in the healthiest of ways but I almost hid who I who I who I was at the time so I didn't really I didn't have friends come like even though I don't think my parents would be like that receptive to it but I didn't have friends come around to my house I didn't want mm -hmm. them to see where I lived mm -hmm. I didn't want them to know that like, I lived in a council house um I didn't want to know I didn't want them to know that side of me so I kind of hid that side of me so it was almost mm -hmm. like I was at school I had you know I've got like I had friends at school and in fact like you know I've got a, a group of like a circle of girls who I'm who are now like my closest friends like you yeah. know for like, 20 plus year relationship yeah um so you know but yeah I always felt like I didn't belong at school I felt the outsider you know I didn't feel like I was like bringing my true self into school because I knew that I was worried about judgment I was worried about you know like almost being pitied or not feel like being valued or being considered the same as everyone else and all I wanted to do was to fit in and I yeah. didn't want to, and anything that kind of like was outside of that I, I hid yeah okay and i i understand that concept so well as well um not necessarily that you want to hide but you don't the you don't feel that they would appreciate you necessarily bringing your authentic self into the classroom or into the the study space how was it when you got to how, i'm just interested as well not just a, i'm interested in um your story in terms of your personal development, but also in terms of your academic side, in terms of, cause you've gone into like communication and stuff like that. Where did that passion for, to go down the route of communicating journalism kind of thing come from? Yeah, so I've always been into um, like studying and at school, like I, you know, I did really well and I loved um, writing in particular. Um, so, and also, um, it was a, a thing in value installed in me, like, obviously, lots of children of immigrants, the power of education, get your education, because, and I have it in my head, it's the one thing that can never be taken from you, once yeah. you have your education, that is it, you know, yeah. so that, and also, I, I also recognised at a very young age, that was my ticket out, if right. I wanted a better quality of life, or a different life and stuff, I'm going to have to get a good education to, mm -hmm. to progress through. Yeah. through this system so um my passion for writing kind of like um developed um alongside my passion for politics and social justice and learning about my the more like in terms of injustices within my my community and you know growing up um in the in the council houses and you realize just like how my mum had to fight and fight just to get basic repairs done in the house. Like it was, you know, just seeing all that play out and stuff and the dynamics. Mm -hmm. So um, as I um, was thinking about my A-levels, I went I went down to sort of a creative route. So I did English, I did history, I did politics for my A-levels and I did psychology, weirdly enough. Um, and then, yeah, and then I studied politics at uni and I loved the writing side. I loved being, to, uh, being able to explore different arguments and I loved, and through my writing, getting my personality and who I am across and stuff. So 
And then that kind of lead me to want to write about using my power of the pen almost to write about people's other people's experiences and telling their stories and seeing if that can make a difference. And that's when I went into journalism to begin with. And I found that, you know, this really, it was great, but poorly, poorly paid. I, yeah. you, even in London as a journalist, no, especially like when you're starting out. And then I moved into communications and I'm here. Okay, um, the, the, I find it fascinating that the, the the journey that you've gone on, but also the kind of like thinking about that process of education being very important, your your parents instilling that into you, looking at the outside world, looking at the um, scenarios which you were playing out in front of you, the injustices which were playing out in front of you, and then going into the journalism or being able to write that experience because it effectively i'm not going to say it's it's you can write somebody's experience um once you've done the investigation and you start to write sometimes color doesn't come into it or race doesn't come into it because you're expressing yourself in a certain way do, do you get what i mean i'm not sure if i um how when you do your pieces what what is it that helps you to to um develop your argument as it were experiences yeah um, sometimes putting myself into um the other person's shoes um sometimes about how that person made me feel as well so i've interviewed people who have you know um people who even in this job who've um had diagnosed with a really serious illness and they've been on one of our clinical trials and now they're better and they're talking about their like their life before the, the clinical trial or living with their illnesses and stuff and so how that like how their story makes me feel and stuff and I try and communicate that in my writing as well. So it's it's giving voice it's hearing the ex experience and live it not necessarily living through the experience but giving voice to that experience. Okay? Yeah yeah so that no i just I, I i just find that whole whole scenario that whole ability to convey somebody else's story um quite fascinating um to be honest and people who can do it really well i applaud them because i think it's a, a major skill to have so in terms of if i just dress back a little bit in terms of whilst you were at university, did you still have those same kind of feelings as you did when you were going through school? Or did you feel you could become more of your authentic self as yeah. you went? Yeah, definitely. Look, I went to um, Leicester University right. and, you know, that was that was such a game changer for me because then I met people who looked like me. I met people like, you know, it was just nice to be not in a sea of white faces, to be honest. Um, and, you know, people, it was just, it was a fresh start because you're out of school. So you're not, with mm -hmm. the, you know, you, you can be who you want to be and stuff. And I was exploring that a bit more about myself at that point and stuff and reading up and learning about, um, you know, through my studies about certain cultures and um, certain, you know, the framing of things and stuff and questioning the education I did receive. So although I got good grades and got good education, I actually started to go back and think about, hang on a minute, how they taught things about civil rights and about figures in the civil rights movement was completely problematic and really, mm -hmm. really, I think, and I'm really, I'm, I'm concerned that they're probably teaching it like this now and just making me think like, why did we spend a lot of time learning about the Tudors and things like that? It just made me think about, you know, um, yeah, I was starting to find my identity a lot more. And I think I found it, I found like-minded people at university and people that I felt like I could be myself and who challenged me as well and challenged the sort of education that I had. And, you know, um, that was really um, interesting. And I think at that point, um, Akala as well was like, I was following him and going to sometimes to his talks and stuff. It was the same age, I think. And, and I was just thinking, how is somebody with like the same age as me with this incredible amount of knowledge and and can express it in a way that is clear and just captivating and that and it was through him that I wanted to explore some of the things that he was talking about and stuff right. and I remember um yeah just something um he did a talk about he had um, a company called the hip-hop Shakespeare company and yeah. talking about 
hip hop and Shakespeare being identical in a way. And like he would read out lyrics and I would think there were Shakespeare lyrics when there were hip hop lyrics. And, you know, so I really that's when my passion for certain types of music came out and stuff like that. So, yeah, I start I, I felt freer to explore myself a lot more at university than I did at school. So it was part it was so in a different environment, you found yourself in a different environment, one which was much more inclusive, mm. not so dominated by or not so um the word i'm looking for the dominant class there wasn't so much of a dominant class in 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 play at that particular mm. university there was a lot more diversity for you to be able to grasp and and learn from and also then having someone like a carla at the same time a, a role model as it were to to yeah. actually think okay this is someone who can help me to explore who i am yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, as, and when i say like exploring myself and the diversity i mean definitely like the lectures and the lecturers and myself like there was still like there were still white and mm -hmm. mainly white men but it was outside of those um structures that when we would have be in the common room or like people in my halls or mm -hmm. like like people that I've just met around campus mm -hmm. and stuff and you form groups and things like that that's mm -hmm. when those more exciting challenging conversations and thoughts would come to play so it wasn't necessarily the university the university course as such but it was just being in that overall environment of being able to be one away from home so so those things like well we don't do sleepovers weren't necessarily in your face as it were right and um, not saying that that's a bad thing but it was you were free to explore who you you were yeah. um, and then the fact that you had so many like-minded individuals who you could have conversations with and, and and discuss things with that's what helped to develop who you are, your identity, and also question you. Yeah. 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 Question everything, like the, the way things were as a, like in my secondary education. And yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that then, in the roles which you're currently undertaking, and you, you briefly touched on it about going into journalism, and some of the limitations with being a gen. Well, do you think some of those limitations was were, were based on on privilege? I'm going to put it as privilege. Was it, did you see other people who you thought, well, I can do that, but you weren't given the opportunities, especially when you were kind of like writing in the journalistic world. Was there yeah. anything like that? Yeah, oh, absolutely, especially in journalism. Um, so, I mean, I worked for The Voice newspaper, so, right. um, and, uh, you know, that was a really big honour and a big coup, and, you know, that was mm -hmm. paper that my parents read and growing up and yeah. stuff like that, so I felt <laughs> really proud to be part of it and to tell those stories that weren't getting the sort of prominence from national newspapers and things like that. Um, so, I've, you know, I felt really proud and glad but then when I thought about how come I can't get into the nationals and stuff what what's the barriers here you know I've published in a national newspaper but why can't I get onto the you know yeah and so it made me um wonder like you know and it is it's like networks and um I actually learned from a job so I was a communications officer um at mm. University of West London and um I actually met a journalist um who just graduated from Oxford and she was work working at the Guardian and I no sorry she was working at the Times and I went oh that's like that's the first a... job and you're working at the times and you're covering the education patch and she was like yeah you know they've got that scheme like with Oxford and the times are they that's, that's how they recruit their journalists like you're I was like oh okay <laughs> like well what chance do I have <laughs> you know what I mean so that was that was eye-opening um and um yeah so yeah definitely I've definitely felt um I was able to write for the independent eventually but the only reason why I was able to write for the independent is that the executive editor at the time was a guy called Peter Victor a black man and he and I met at an industry event and he had read some of my work and I introduced myself and stuff it's only through that conversation it's like right I'm going to give you a chance because I've got the power now so I'm going to yeah. bring you in and he brought me in and that's the only way so you know it's not like there's a job you apply 
you you know it's it, it's through those ways that you get those opportunities but you know as I made the example about um the journalist who worked got straight into the times after leaving Oxford like how can yeah. I compare that yeah yeah I uh, so it wasn't necessarily the idea of it being a meritocracy the idea that it's based on merit it's not so much based on merit it's more based on who you know and who knows you yeah, yeah yeah and um obviously the you know if you go to oxford and you you know they've got that skip like i don't know if they have that now but definitely then yeah. you know well there's you know it's reaching those levels where those op much more opportunities are available to you um then yeah but i'm gonna move on from that because I, I i i i hear you and i i, I really appreciate what you've said but you you're a bit of a trailblazer yourself though aren't you really am i yeah, yeah, yeah. You're downplaying what, what, what I know that you, right? Because I'm pretty sure that if, I, if I know, I'm not going to say I'm pretty sure, I know that you also started um, as a leadership program with, with, with Google. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I am part of the exec leadership program. So this is for um, BME professionals. Um, it's sponsored, yeah, so it's supported by Google um, and the CIPR. And it's a year long course um, where it's, you know, we're working with some incredible people, organizations, and it's about developing you as the next leader. So um, it was a program where I had to apply for it, have to interview for it. Um, I was interviewed by incredible people um, and I got one of 10 places. So I'm one of 10 on the course. So, I'm, I, yeah. So when I got the um, confirmation that I got a place, I was like, whoa, because hundreds applied and then to get one of 10 places. So, yeah. <laughs> But, you're still downplaying yourself here Maxine we're gonna have to work on this 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 self-confidence part because uh, um I think it's amazing um what was it that motivated you to actually go for a position like that I I have started I would say over the last couple of years really finding my voice and finding my voice at work um when I joined um Imperial so it was about eight eight years I'm the longest I've ever been at a job but, <laughs> but I felt I I remember going into Imperial on my first day and I was the only non-white person in the division and it was like whoa I was like it felt like being back at my secondary school again I was like right okay it's really just me um and that and I would go into meetings and and I'll look and I'll be like oh my god this is so overwhelming and intimidating and I hid myself for so long so I got on with the work I did my job but I didn't speak out I didn't speak up I just I always felt so othered mm -hmm. and then I then over the years I was like no something's wrong here no 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 because I you know I think I got to like third fourth year and I was like how are we still like why are we still white why are we still all white mm -hmm. this is like what's going on here and I would start to raise it and raise it and raise it and stuff and you know and when I did raise it people would you know like when people are really uncomfortable and don't want to have the conversation and then they make it about themselves like but I'm not racist it's like but I'm not well I'm saying we've got a problem here mm -hmm. and I think over the years as the you know um as um the division has grown and developed and more people have come in and I think it's been great to have other people say there's a problem so it's not just me that's saying there's a problem yeah. um but finding my voice to speak out just started to develop and I think over especially over the last two years I've found who like who I am my voice and I was like actually if I want to get when I get to a senior position I want to be the one to help bring in the next generation the next yeah. like I don't want to have I want to provide those opportunities I want to do what Peter Victor did for me yeah I want to you know so I was and I was thinking well um when I saw this leadership program and the program looked excellent and the person behind it Elizabeth Bananuko is a, a hero of mine she's yeah. incredible yeah. um I was like yeah I want to I want to learn to be a leader I want to grow to be a leader but then I you know essentially I want to be able to to offer opportunities and be able to create those opportunities for people and stuff so that was one of the reasons why I applied for it but initially I downloaded the application and then I looked at it and I was like oh no I'm not good enough 
And I actually, it got towards the deadline and Elizabeth's like, you downloaded the application. So why haven't you applied? I was like, well, I don't think I'm senior enough. And she was like, are you stupid? Just apply because you never know. You don't know. I can't guarantee anything, but you don't know. So she was the one who's like driven, like pushed me to like stop, stop doubting myself and just go for it. And I'm really glad I did because I wouldn't be here on the program. No, that's, that's fantastic. And I, I like your honesty there in terms of that, that kind of like you need in that, affirmation that somebody else to push you forward you, you you took the initial step but you got to so far and I think that happens with a lot of people they'll take that initial step they'll then read the criteria and say well that's not me um that, that's some that's somebody else when mm. actually the potential is there within you mm. and it was then having that other person a champion as it were or a sponsor to say actually you you can do this you need to apply so and the fact that you, as you said, when you first came into the division or when you first came to Imperial, it was so white, right? And you've seen a transformation in the past um, eight years that it's still white, but it's not so white. Yeah, we still have a long way to go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm kind of qualified <laughs> that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> we still have a long way to go, but it's we can see progress the question is is how quickly is progress moving mm. and the fact that you're from what you've said and that your objectives is to be that help as to help other people get into positions i think that's a good thing yeah. i think that's a real good thing what would you say has been some of your um i'm just wary of the time and i should see if there's anyone else who would like to ask a question but what would you like to see happen um, going forward in terms of your own personal development, the development of, at Imperial or, or wherever, when you think about race um, and social justice, I should say? Um, I guess from my perspective, in terms of um, like where I want to be, like development and stuff, mm -hmm. I... Um, I remember um, when I was um, interviewed for the exec program and they asked me where I want to be in my career and I kind of went well and I whis almost like I whispered it and I went I would like to be comms director I think I might get there in 10 years and one of the person who interviewed me is the CEO of, an, um, of Ketchum PR agency and um, she was like uh, say it louder you are going to be comms director and you're going to be there before 10 years so I know that for a fact so just own that thank you <laughs> and it's almost like Yep, okay. And <laughs> um, so, yeah, I want to be initiating change. I want to be um, influencing. I want to be, you know, I want to create a workspace that I didn't have at the start of my career. I don't want people, I don't want, you know, there's been, people are going to have negative experiences in their career, but it's the thought of like, go an all white divi communications division for a university that says they're a global university is not right. That's just not right. And I don't, and I, you know, that needs to definitely, definitely change. And it's not just about um, hiring people because, you know, you can hire, you can hire as many people. It's about whether they stay, what the promotion chance is, what are the, what's the pay. So it's all those things that, you know, um, Imperial and other organizations definitely have to work on and stuff. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to be spearheading that change, but also I want to be, spearheading that change but also utilizing my expertise in other areas of comms I can do yeah. you know I can do strategic comms and um, I want to do you know crisis comms and things like that so yeah. you know um I think we leave the burden of um um of inclusivity and diversity to the ones that didn't create the structures in the first place and didn't create that in the first place and that's and I, and I fundamentally feel that um our non-white counter our, our white counterparts need to need to be driving a lot of it and need to be getting on board and stuff and not leaving it to for us to solve or clean up the mess because we didn't make it in the first place yeah. so yeah so I definitely want to see a complete there needs I still feel like there still needs to be that click for people and to realize that because we're not going to move on you can't you know it's it's extra labor at the end yeah. of the day but you're not getting paid for so yeah. you know so I, I think that's what I would like to see so you want to see change you want to influence change mm -hmm. um you want to take part in helping the change to happen, but you don't want that responsibility to say it just falls on our shoulders to, to make the change happen. Because as you said, 
we're not the ones who made the mess in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I think like, yeah, I think that's a fair, I think taking up, you know, being part of it, being part of the change and stuff, but we shouldn't be the, we shouldn't be the only ones doing it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, I often, um, when I see, like, sometimes when I see leadership positions, um, and it's often like somebody's been promoted and it'd be a diversity inclusion mob. That's great if you want to do it. But sometimes it would be great. What I loved, um, I think I saw a, st um, a story a couple of years ago. It might mm -hmm. be the timeline. But the new CEO of John Lewis, a black woman. Yeah. She's your CEO. Sharon White. Yeah. 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 She's chairwoman, sorry. Yeah. Um, this, it's not about diversity and inclusion. She's just the chairwoman of this huge organization that she's yeah. responsible for. And it's much, mm -hmm. much wider. And yeah. that's what I love to see, because sometimes the only opportunities you often get to get to senior levels is what if, whether there's a diversity and inclusion part into your role. And I think yeah. that's not right either, because, again, we're much wider than that. We have got so many different skills and perspectives and things that we can do. And I yeah. think, yeah. So you, someone's put in the you want to be the absolute whole package. You want to see the whole package. You don't want to just be pigeonholed into kind of like black woman she'll deal with edi issues she, you don't want that you want them you want to be able to say right as you said crisis comms what, whatever other kinds of initiatives which looks at the whole communications field you want to be involved with influencing the direction that that takes exactly exactly um and and this is not to say i don't i absolutely absolutely care about edi yeah. i'm absolutely passionate about it i definitely want to I want change in that perspective but yeah but also i also want to be part of the change in terms of strategic things around you know the organization yeah. um you know things like that you know mm -hmm. that's what i want yeah that's what i i think because I, I can yeah i think i i, I know i can do it <laughs> Look, yeah, that's right as the lady said as, as the lady said on your interview panel uh, you will be the comms director right you can do it, right? You definitely can. I'm just looking to see, are there any questions that um, anyone would like to ask at this point? Um, I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. Okay. If not, I will carry on. Okay. So we've said, you've said about um, what you'd like to see. Uh, what is, Dawn, are you? Um, yeah, I was. I was only going to say. Oh, hold on a minute. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thanks. Uh, I was only going to say. I just applaud Maxine for what she's doing, and her, her um, speech uh, uh, presentation has been really great. That's all I wanted to say, really. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dawn. Thank you. Dawn. All right. No. I, I, I agree with Dawn, it has been fantastic. Um, I'm, I just want to explore a few other things then in terms of what are some of the barriers that we, we, we currently can see happening? Or what kind of barriers do you think are in the way of you making the progression to where you want to be? What would you say are the things that you think you're going to need to overcome and what are the support mechanisms which you think you're going to need in order to get to the next level? Um, I guess if we're talking in the context of um, like in, um, Imperial, um, I guess the barrier for me um, is probably, you know, because um, the next step for me logically would be head of the of, a, of um, communications or a similar type of role would be the next one. Um, obviously these roles sometimes don't come up very often. Um, mm -hmm. you know, people are very rude to stay at Imperial for quite a long time and stuff and, you know, mm -hmm. moving on, you know, it's not the same as other organizations were. So I think that could, that's probably a barrier for me as well. I think what a barrier would also be for me as well, and it's something that um, Elizabeth Madanuka talked about and stuff. It was about the fact that, okay, I can become head of communications, but then I recognize that I'll be the only like one that's mm -hmm. not like in that sort of leadership role. Mm -hmm. um, and again, what support would, that I would need in terms of navigating that space by myself, really, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have like, I would have my peers and stuff, but they wouldn't be able to relate to me on this, on this, on that level mm -hmm. and stuff. So I think the support I would probably um, need would be, um, you know, 
and I've got that right now. I've got a mentor who's very senior at Ketchum. She is amazing and she understands and she gets it and stuff like that. But I think having a mentor would probably help me in that respect and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I think that's probably, yeah, I think that's the barrier. I think if I looked outside of Imperial as, as well. So again, sometimes I feel like um, when people say we're going to recruit more diverse, like more diverse people into roles, but they often recruit at a certain level and then mm -hmm. the higher up you go, the whiter it gets mm -hmm. and gets. And I think like going in again, navigating that space for me, that's going to be a challenge. And, you know, and then that bringing up feelings of like being back at school again and, you yeah. know, and all that stuff. So I think that, that, that definitely something I think about all the time. And also you feel the pressure a lot more. So once you're in those senior positions, you, re you really, really have to perform. Sometimes I feel like I have to be on it all the time I have yeah. to be perfect all the time I can't yeah. afford to make any mistakes so even though like people will tell me it's fine to make a mistake and stuff sometimes it still takes a while for me to like but is it really is it okay for me to make a mistake yeah. it might be okay for somebody else but is it yeah. really, like you feel that pressure to yeah. deliver and to perform a lot more and not to slip up because yeah. it's almost like if you slip up that's it you've killed it for everyone else they're never ever ever going to bring in and somebody else that's not from their usual pool yeah. And so that's, yeah, that's yeah. key. It's interesting you should say that because I was listening to Question Time last night where they were having um, a discussion about racism and, and the roots of racism, etc. And one of the things which was mentioned was about um, as a black person, you don't have the luxury to make mistakes because you, other people can make mistakes. And the illustration that they gave was, let's say, a black football manager right, who has an opportunity to manage in the premiership. If they get things wrong, okay, whereas other managers, you'll see them on like a conveyor belt, they'll be in the running for another top job. You very rarely see that happen with, with a black manager. They have that one opportunity and if they blow it, it's gone. There's no second chance as it, it would seem. So, um, what I want to, what we need to do then is also make sure that we also make opportunities for ourselves, mm. not necessarily just be reliant on, um, be reliant on the current system. We may well have to make a parallel system. Um, mm. And so you could be the trailblazer for some institution mm. which we don't know about yet, but it, the, the seeds are there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that as, as well like creating your own spaces as well and you know like I I was exposed to that very early on like you mm -hmm. know when, like the voice came out of the need for uh, a paper that will report on Black Britain and what's right. happening and the story you know so I was exposed to that quite yeah so I definitely definitely agree yeah. and you know, and you know I'm part of the Black Cons Network because I wanted to be part like where are they where are they all the other PR yeah. professionals that are not white where are they yeah and it's like oh my god we are all here we've all, yeah. great, we've all been here so it's, it's yeah definitely absolutely absolutely yeah. maxine i'm going to ask you one final question all right and that question is um if you had advice which you were given to a your 16 year old self what advice would it be oh, don't fit in love your um love your hair love your lovely curly hair and never make and you know embrace it don't um love like be proud to bring your mum's cooking into school because it was great um I wish I was like I could turn back and those kids were like why does it smell like that it's like because it's seasoned I would love to be, <laughs> I'd love to be able to do that now <laughs> um, <laughs> uh love your like be proud like don't be ashamed of your background like um you know um it's not about where you start as well like where you start um you know um so yeah I'll definitely I would tell her that I would tell my 16 year old self that there's nothing wrong with you you don't need to shrink yourself you don't need to try and be like the other girls or people in your school and stuff and be proud of your culture be proud of yourself and be proud of your background because even though yes um I grew up in a council house yes I grew up in a council estate my parents really really worked hard to really try and like give us a life and stuff and you know I'm here and I'm like really proud and really you know like what my my, what my parents have done for me and stuff so yeah just owning who I am that's what I would say and yeah 
Yeah, make better choices with boys. Make better choices with boys. <laughs> I won't go down that route, but I understand. <laughs> I, I understand that. But I, I, I love the fact that you, you gave, um, acknowledged the sacrifice, but also the love that your parents showed in, in getting you to where you are now. You know, yeah. and I'm 100% sure that they're very proud of you. All right. So, so it's been a pleasure having you on um, this okay. week. It's, it's been really, really good. All right. I'm going to just um, highlight what we've got on next week. Um, so next week, oops, we're going to have a young medic, um, Kweku de Asante, um, and he's a medical student here at Imperial College, um, but he's also a street doctor. Um, and he's going to give his background, his story about getting to medical school and a number of other things. So it's going to be another really interesting um, discussion with Kweku next week. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity to um, see any of the other Belonging series, you can you can tune into our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging hyphen IAO. So have a look at some of the other interviews which we've done there. And I want to just say another big thank you to Maxine and everyone have a good weekend. Thank you. <laughs>